Welcome everybody to the Monday, March 21st meeting of the Conway Select Board. Um, call the meeting to order and ask for a motion to approve the minutes of March 14th. Have they arrived? Yes. Yes. They just came? They just came. They're, they're hot off the press. But yeah. They're fine. I don't have to take your word for it because I didn't get them yet. Oh, there they are. They look great. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yes. She imperceptibly nodded yes. Uh, so, we could talk about meetings attended by select board, and blah, 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 but Natalie is waiting. So, we, why don't we just move her up on the agenda so that um, we don't keep anybody winning? We're polite here in Conway, you know. I'm so, playing here in Sunderland too, so I'm happy to wait. It's yes, really yes. whatever your preference is. Uh, all right, meetings attended by select. Go ahead. None. No. Nope. No. <laughs> well, we had tomorrow. Okay, I had Conway School Committee meeting that approved the budget. Um, uh, we had the final uh, negotiating session with our union. We, we've now concluded all the, the uh, negotiating. We've concluded all agreements with all four unions. Um, we had a meeting of the ARPA committee. And I had a meeting of the building, uh, the public safety building committee. So we're, with our ARPA money, one of the things that we're doing is we're, that we, we have for 40 something years, we've been, the town has been fantasizing about doing something with its public safety building. Um, across from Oesco on Route 116. Yeah. And um, so we're fine. We're going to be using our money to do that. It's not going to be enough. We can do the engineering though. Yeah, we'll do the engineering for it. But there's, we're going to be, we're, we're going to need financing. It'd be great if we could get like a little item, line item in the governor's budget, like Bernerstein did or what, what, whatever some of the local, public safety building seems to be one of the, like the only municipal building project that seems to ever get special funding like that. So I don't, and um, seeing as this is our first time that I, I, that, st that station was built in the 1950s. Yeah. So seeing it's our first time in 65 years, do something with public safety building. Um, maybe, maybe we'll get some attention from the powers that be. Um, and and then I had a meeting with the pool committee people because they have environmental uh, because of the dam. So they have um, they need they need to update their paperwork. But they were very nervous. They, emergency action. Emergency action plan. Mm. Um, the state said so. So it could just be like Ashfield and just never do it for twenty five years, even though the dam's much more dangerous. But um, but uh, apparently there's a desire to abide by the law here in Conway. I don't know why. Um, so any public, there's no public comments. So with that, we can go to the annual update from state representative, Natalie Blaze. Welcome Natalie. It's good to be here with you virtually. Hopefully we'll see each other in person sometime soon. Yes. And with me tonight, I have Corinne Coriat, who is my legislative aide. Corinne, you want to introduce Hello. yourself? Welcome. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Corinne. I think I have met, maybe I haven't met your board, actually. I know Erica because I went to school with her daughter. Um, <laughs> but yeah, happy to be here. This is Erica Goldman, <laughs> Bob, Bob Armstrong, Hi. and I'm Phil yeah. Cantor. I've, I've, I've spoken with Bob, so maybe just Phil. I haven't met you before. Lovely well, to meet you. Yeah, we're good. It's it's good to be here with you all tonight. As you know, by now, I have worked with, with you all for several years now. This is just an opportunity for, for us to have a conversation where we can talk about the town's priorities. Just make sure that, um, you know, I am on the same page as you in terms of what those priorities are moving forward. 
uh, and determining any ways that I can best support you. Um, Phil, I have to say, you know, one of the topics that you just brought up is something that I've been working really hard on uh, with Senator Comerford and Senator Hines in terms of introducing legislation to establish a municipal building authority. Uh, this was legislation that we introduced this session. It creates a building authority much like the MBLC and the MSBA uh, that will specifically fund municipal buildings. In the legislation that I offered, there was a, it was a municipal building and public safety uh, complex legislation that would create a dedicated funding stream to support communities as they are building you know, senior centers, public safety complexes, whatever it happens to be. This legislation has, has gotten some, some traction given the auditor bumps most recent report that really called into question the amount of state investment that has been going into communities in Western Massachusetts and the need to reinvest in our towns. So I, I'm hopeful that we will be able to move that forward. Uh, if not this session, then next session. The real challenge, of course, is identifying a steady stream of funding uh, so that we're not relying on these one-time ARPA dollars to fund um, you know, these facilities that our, our towns really need. Uh, maybe we can use those ARPA funds as seed money, but what we, what we really need long-term is a dedicated funding source to make sure that our communities can rely on this program year after year after year, much like they've come to rely on the MBLC and MSBA programs. So I appreciate you bringing that up. And, uh, and happy to talk about anything that you want to talk about tonight. I just wanted well, to make it, sure that we the, made time you know, for it. The, the, those programs, though, are they 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 give you that you get funding from them, but they raise the cost of the project so much that it's really difficult to ascertain from the outset whether the funding that you get counteracts the the right and the, because you you're you're so limited to the listing of approved contractors. Yeah. And those are such a small group of numbers, uh, group, you know, group, group of very large companies, um, several of whom always have, you know, uh, alleged ties to organized crime, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the, you know, you get the, the last time when our town did that for the for the for our grammar school roof 20 years ago, we've we've had to rebuild that roof three times since then at great cost to the town because um, we made the mistake of settling the first lawsuit for way too less. Um, and, and, yeah, and, I, I think and, and, and you saw friend. like Deerfield Elementary when they went the MSBA route for their elementary school, it almost caused a riot at town meeting. Um, and the, the, those, the, 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 the you know, just, um, and, and, and you're stuck paying the prevailing wage and all that, which is, you know, the, the way that we've done it here with our with our uh, town garage facility, which was to squirrel away 100,000 a year for I don't know how many years ahead of time, and then to separate the projects so that you don't have to do all the overhead and so that you can do local contractors and then to get the tech school electrical classes and plumbing classes in. And we just cobbled together something on our own. Because saved the fortune, and we saved. You know, we, you should be a consultant, Phil. We did with that experience. We did so. So we did. We did what was estimated to be a three and a half million dollar project for a little over a million dollars. But, but I think most towns like us, in similarly situated, we can't even afford to play in like with all the shiny new toys that come out of Boston. Um, and this is. You know, hopefully this will be a, a you know, I don't want to rain on your parade. I'm really glad that you that, no, that no, this no, is going no. on. No, I, but, no, uh, I appreciate that's certainly something that, you know, having heard from communities that I understand, and it's something that we've talked about that you, know, you might not need an entire building authority to do this. You might just need a grant program um, that would go directly to communities to determine how they you know, want to fund these projects. We've also talked about ensuring that there is a rural um, formula baked into whatever program that we're developing because we have seen you know, that our rural communities don't have the financial capacity to be able to fund these large projects um, and that there is a larger need in our rural communities here in Western Massachusetts. So, I, I, and I love, Phil, I love your point here. I mean, we want to make sure that we're supporting the local economy. The final thing is, you know, 
libraries and school buildings are designed to serve hundreds, if not thousands of people. Um, our public safety facilities are really designed to house large equipment um, and our volunteer firefighters. And we wanna make sure that we are serving both of those purposes to the very best of our abilities, but it certainly doesn't require the same sort of oversight that the MBLC or the MSBA does because it's not having to ensure you know, the safety of hundreds of, hundreds of people or, or th even thousands of, of students. Um, so that's something that we've also taken into consideration as we've explored this. And you know, there's still a lot of work to do, but I'm, I'm really hopeful that we'll be able to get to a point that we can advance a, a building authority that would allow us to meet the goals of you know, maintaining our historic town halls. You know, I, I know that the, I think the cupola still might need some, some work in Conway, you know, as we're looking at senior centers, as we're looking at our historic uh, town buildings, public safety complexes, salt sheds, uh, garage buildings, you know, all of these things are municipal buildings and we really need to be investing in them in a way that is hopefully spurring economic development, supporting our small businesses in the community. Yeah, we, we have, um, but we have just this chronic inability to add to our infrastructure that's so badly needed. And, um, you know, we've, there's been a group trying to do a community septic um, in Conway and that the cost of doing that, and that, that would be a 10,000 gallon tank that would serve all, cause we're hundred percent septic, like so many of our rural towns. And um, that would serve 70 or 80 of the homes that are closest to the river. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's just small enough so that it wouldn't be regulated by DP with the need for the daily with the daily tests and this and that. Um, but but just to do that, the cost of that is a million and a half dollars. Mm -hmm. And we can't the 79 homes can't fund it by themselves. The 500 and something or 600 and something homes that wouldn't. How fair you know how fair is it to make them fund it um, when they don't they wouldn't be benefiting from it. So that it, things like that. I, I, you know, we can never really get started on, um, e even though we need to do it. And sooner or later, we're going to really, really need to do it because Clean Water Act, all that stuff. And, um, and all of our septic systems were built in 1970 and one by one they fail and each homeowner gets stuck with a $50,000, $60,000 bill. And um, yeah, so. Yeah, I'd be interested, you know, we made a really strong push to, you know, we pulled together uh, several communities here in Western Massachusetts uh, in a forum when Senator Comerford and I were just elected to begin to explore ways to fund water and sewer infrastructure projects. And we, the secretary of EEA agreed with us that we need to be spending money on that and agreed to allow the MVP program to be used for water and sewer infrastructure. Um, so that might be something if you haven't already explored, we can yeah. certainly ask about for that project, and, but. You know. And we haven't, the, the requirements for that are that, you know, the, it, it's a chicken or the, the egg kind of thing. That wasn't that? You can do one stop. Okay. One stop, yeah. And for any of those grant yeah. programs that you're applying for, we'd be happy to write letters of support or contact the agencies. It, the challenge that we're always running into is, um, you know, once the grant application is open, it's hard for us to get you know, administration officials out here to yeah. look at look at the project and talk to you about why it's important. So, to the extent that you're identifying these programs and projects. Um, let us know. And then prior to the grant round opening, we can invite the administration officials out here to talk with you and to learn more about the projects. We did that um, for a one-stop uh, roadway project out in Huntington and had them out on the side of Route 66. They'd been applying for that project for five years maybe. Um, and they were finally funded at a million dollars this last round. Uh, but they, you know, getting them out here and seeing why these projects are important, I think is really instrumental in terms of making the case and providing feedback on how we can submit su successful applications. So to the extent that you know what those grant programs are and the projects that you have identified for them, just let us know and we're happy to make the invitation and, and attend you know, any site visit to Western Massachusetts from agency, well, administration officials. Yeah. And you know that the the 
the other, you know, we, we, I think we were all just really um, pretty, pretty disappointed in the governor's budget when that came out and um, just the, what he did to us with the pilot pro, with our pilot reimbursement, what he did with our chapter seven, you know, our school frontier is one of those 40% of districts that only get 10, whatever, $30 per student, $30 per student, and yeah. which is less than one, you know, and less than 1% increase and inflation is 7%. And we just did a contract that's 3%, you know, for it, it's just, well, if you didn't see it, Phil, I did take the Secretary of Education to task a little bit on that uh, at this see that. Last week's Ways and Means hearing. Um, you know, as we're talking about rural communities being left behind, this is certainly one way where we're seeing that. And really, I mean, we needed the Student Opportunity Act 100%. Um, and now we have the Rural Schools Act, the Rural Schools Commission that, that Senator Hines and I are working on finalizing this spring. Um, and there are several recommendations that we will be uh, pursuing, but this is certainly something that's come to the fore in terms of what we might be able to do this budget to be able to deal with those inflationary factors that we're seeing really hitting our small communities pretty hard. And uh, you know, I apologize for like focusing on the school stuff so much, but it is two thirds of our budget. And um, yeah, it's, I've, and I've also been on the, Frontier School Committee for, I don't know, what, 12 years now, and head of the budget committee most of that time. Um, and um, and you have Shelly, you got Shelly Parita. You know. Shining star. I, I treat her <laughs> as nice as I possibly can. I really do. <laughs> I go out of my way. She'll, 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 she'll vouch for that. So I spare her from friendly fire, for sure. Um, <laughs> But it, yeah, she's amazing, and we're we're lucky. And um, any increases in Chapter ninety coming up? Yeah, another one. So Chapter ninety, uh, the the House just passed a supplemental that would allow for an additional hundred million dollars for winter road maintenance, which will be distributed by road mileage. So it doesn't have the complicated Chapter ninety uh, funding formula. It'll just be right by road mileage. Um, we. I don't know if we'll see uh, a higher amount proposed in the FY23 budget going forward. Uh, we're just in the process of developing the house budget. I would certainly be supportive of $300 million at a minimum. I would also be supportive of a multi-year chapter 90 program so that people can plan ahead. Uh, we have been getting some pretty good traction on the unpaved roads uh, legislation that I've offered in order to direct some additional funds to our rural communities where in some cases 50 to 60 percent of the total roadway mileage is dirt rather than pave um that's us <laughs> i think you're one of my my poster children for this legislation uh, and by the way I, I do want to put a plug in for franklin regional council of governments they just made a map an online map available where you can um talk about roadways here in Franklin County and the condition of those dirt roads as we try to talk about and really present the story of the, the, the impact, the financial impact that this is having on our communities, as well as the public safety impact that it's having for people who may need to have an ambulance get to their houses and just oh. can't get there. And the economic impact that it's having is people can't get to their jobs because their chassis has been torn out of the bottom of their car. Um, you know, those are things that we really need to be talking about and explaining to, you know, folks outside of the area who just don't understand what it's like to live in Western Massachusetts during mud season or after these more frequent severe storms that we've been experiencing in terms of, of rain. So I think that this is something that we will continue to talk about, particularly as we see these more frequent um, more intense storms that let's let's face it are the result of climate change. Well, you know when you hear that chapter ninety has uh, re has stayed flat since for yeah. ten years yeah. now, and and you um you know and, and the cost of building a road has just skyrocketed to where what is it three hundred thousand more three hundred fifty thousand a mile to do it on the cheap. And uh, you say I thought it was a million dollars a mile. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we do. You know, we don't. I think it's one hundred seventy thousand, but it, but it's a lot. 
Yeah. And, then, Going up. and, yeah. and um, it's, we, we, we're not able to do as good a job as we used to be able to do. And it's not our fault, but we get blamed for it. Um, we're also checking into whether or not the, the, the life of pavement has changed as a result of climate change uh, with the more frequent freeze thaw cycles. You know, what, what you may have expected the life of a, a paving job to last, you know, has that decreased as a result of, you know- That are the increased there? trucks. There's, there's increased a lot trucks. more Amazon delivery and True. large trucks. Um, yeah. the, the 18 wheelers that are going through Conway and up into Buckland on the mm -hmm. back roads. Huge, heavy trucks. Hmm. And that's the, an the important, uh, like all of these things are things that we, we have to be talking about as yeah. we're talking about um, increasing funding, funding for our local roads programs. We, we, we need to get the e people from the eastern part of the state to come and drive from Conway up into Buckland. <laughs> uh, I, it, it, a famous road that, that now is, they have big signs up, gravel road. I mean, this is the paved road. And it's now being labeled as a gravel road. It's really what it and, is. And now. the worst part's not even in Conway, but I still get crap about it. You yeah, know, that's not we, yeah, we, we hear it. It's, it's in Buffalo. <laughs> it's not even our this road. It's not a Conway road. <laughs> yeah. But 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 you go high, You get higher up the list of um, in in the Department of Transportation list if if you can certify that ambulances can't get the road is so bad your ambulances can't get on it and people are going to die if they have to call nine one one. Then you, then you get to move up the list. Until then, SOL. Um, but yeah. So, and the other thing is, um, you know, like a, a lot of the school stuff, regional, tra the, the transportation, which is another thing that it's not just that they never have kept their promise at 100%. It's just that th that's the thing in the budget process that they wait the very longest to tell you <laughs> what, what it is. Usually we find out that number, you know. The, the, that's the morning that the governor's signing the budget. And, and that's a that's a recommendation that we'll be pursuing in the rural schools report um, because it has it has been brought up by everyone that we've talked to uh, that that transportation reimbursement really needs to um, that promise needs to be kept. So that is something that we are addressing in the report. And, and the number to do it at one hundred percent was under one hundred million dollars, right? For regionals, yeah. And the, but you know the. When, when I when we think about when we talk about this stuff in this, you know, I, I had this conversation with the superintendent with Shelly not that long ago. Structurally, if if we if our school instead of being just a regional seven through twelve and four independent school districts with Sunderland, Deerfield, Conway, and Waitley, if we were fully regionalized, then we'd be able to get the transportation reimbursement for the towns for the for the town schools, um, and that uh, although. All of the school committees and actually all the select boards right now kind of pretty much get along and and we we can't fully regionalize because we can't afford to because the law says that you have to all have the same health insurance uh, um, uh, fee, you know uh, fee, fee you know with the uh, copay you have to have the same copay and Conway's at seventy five percent and what's Sunderland fifty five yeah. percent yeah whatever and so the cost to equalize everybody at con because it, it have to be it, the the laws release it has to go up to it can't go we we wouldn't be able to go down the cost to equalize everybody is a million dollars a year yeah. and but it has been important enough to the state that in the past to get districts to do this they pay, they gave you that carrot they they had a special appropriation to get you to zero. And if we could get to zero, mm -hmm. we could do that. But, um, and the, the last one that, that was done by the state, I was told was Acton Boxborough in like 2011 or 2012. Mm -hmm. um, but, and the state gave whatever millions of dollars needed for Bo Boxborough to be up to up with Acton. Mm -hmm. And then they were able to regionalize. Then it, the state has an inherent goal for that because it's a lot less ha headache for the state the towns would save money the the um from reimbursement you know, and think, yeah, things like that they, yeah. they, we used to, they used to help us do like structural things like that yeah but they don't yeah and that it's it, that's something we've heard on the rural schools commission too is uh the shared services piece is something that that should be supported 
that there are too many disincentives to regionalize or even consider regionalization. And you know, what we just saw in the governor's FY23 budget was zero, zeroing out the regionalization line item. Uh, you know, when I asked the secretary about to explain how that came to be, um, you know, I, it, I'm paraphrasing here, but it was that, you know, it, it wasn't yielding what it was supposed to be yielding, it, you know, and I, I just said, I think that our communities in Western Massachusetts would disagree with you, Mr. Secretary. So, you know, we're going to continue to make the case and continue to um, point out at every single turn uh, the ways that the this administration uh, can be better supporting our rural communities and and hopefully also conveying the message to folks who are running for statewide office right now that they need to be paying attention to what is happening in our rural communities across the Commonwealth. There are 170 rural communities and you know we do matter. <laughs> we, we, we absolutely need the state to be investing in us and caring about us. Uh, so we'll, we'll continue to make that case and, and certainly with your partnership and support. Are we gonna be impacted by losing a rep? We're, we're losing a rep sheet out here. We, we are. Uh, I am picking up a lot of uh, Rep Marks district and I, uh, you know, I think that we've always tried to punch above our weight and we'll continue to do that. It's really hard when we had, you know, 13 representatives here in Western Massachusetts and 13 representatives in the city of Boston. Uh, it's always been a struggle. And all I can say is I think you have the commitment of all of us legislators here in Western Massachusetts to, to work together to make sure our voices are heard. Yeah, I'm not criticizing our- No, no, I know. <laughs> I know, I know. No, I, so to your Body, point, but though, we're looking at a rep, here, but here's, a seat. here's, uh, yeah, no, here's the thing. And this is what I, this is, I, I, I continue to I talk about this every chance I get. You know, if we do not start investing in Western Massachusetts, we are going to see continuing population declines over the next 10 years. And when we come around to the next census, you know, are we going to lose another seat? Yeah, I, I don't think that the numbers are going to point to that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that if we don't begin to invest in education in rural communities, in transportation, in our roadways, in public transportation, in EV charging infrastructure, um, in jobs, you know, the, the, the conversation that I had with the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development, there were three slides talking about downtown revitalization that all focused on urban and gateway cities. We need that investment as well. And there should be dedicated programs available to support our rural communities so that we're supporting our small businesses that are really the backbones of our economy. If we don't take that holistic approach, I am concerned, Bob, that we are going to continue to lose population. And, and I hope that we don't get to the point where we've lost so much population that we would lose another house seat. That, that would really be an awful situation for us to be here um, in 10 you know, 10 years from now seeing the same thing. But it just, it, it goes to show you that unless we take a strategic approach where we are investing in Western Massachusetts, uh, that that is there. There was a state program to encourage people to move out here. Uh, uh, Senator Lesser proposed was, it. Was it a work from home program? Or I, can't, I can't remember. It was a, somehow it was going to fund people to move out to Western Massachusetts. Yeah, Senator Lesser introduced legislation to do that. I don't, I forget what happened to it. I think it was last session. Last um, session, yeah. yeah. But the fact of the matter is that we also have a, um, we have a reputation that we have to get over. You know, for so long, people have thought that Western Massachusetts was a black hole that didn't have broadband. And now we do have broadband. Uh, we have in some of our communities, we have some of the fastest broadband in the Commonwealth. And we also have a really high quality of life. And that's a story that, that we now have to tell is that you can live and work here and have a tremendous quality of life and really be able to contribute to our communities in a way that, that makes you feel good and really uh, allows you to grow a family if you want one uh, or just be a valued member of your community. So, 
you know, that's something I've talked to MBI about. And I've said, you know, it's great that you've helped us to get to this point. And now we need to turn the next chapter and tell people our story uh, that we do have great broadband and that people uh, can live and work out here. I think it's not just, you know, you're not just up against Boston, though. It's the sub the suburbs, too. Like I remember a couple of years ago, we went when the Education Commission um, was doing its road show and we went to Northampton and Alice Pish came out. And, um, and, you know, and, and, I, and I remember sitting right next to Trevor McDaniel from Deerfield Select Board when, when he asked, you know, what about full funding for regional transportation? And she said, I'm opposed to that. It's a niche issue. Niche issue. It only affects a few of you out here. And, um, you know, and then the next year, MMA names her the legislator of the year and makes her the keynote speaker at the annual convention. I wanted to throw up. <laughs> but. Well, I have to say that uh, Chair Peich, uh, you know, I met with her several times as the Student Opportunity Act was being considered. Uh, I know Senator Hines was working in on the Senate side to see if we could get the rural schools report that had already been issued by DOE uh, worked into the legislation that we were considering. Um, we weren't able to do that at that time because of the charge of the Foundation Budget Review Commission. Uh, but what we were able to do, and I have to say it was with her support, uh, was to get this Rural Schools Commission so that we could have this blue ribbon commission pulling together the data we needed to make the case for additional support, changes in policies and programs, uh, and hopefully some funding too. That's another way to look at it, though, is that she's just doing what doesn't cost any money, which is giving you a commission and letting you talk about it and maybe maybe blow off some steam that way. But when oh, when, but, but, but when it actually comes, <laughs> when, when it letting you, meaning us, all of us. But, um, but but when it comes to, you know, actually funding it, um, you know, does her bedrock opposition as it is, it still a niche issue no matter how much data there is, you know, I mean, it's just, it, she, I remember her saying, this does not benefit any in my district at all. Mm -hmm. And that truth will still be, they have all the people, we have all the needs. And, um, you know, well, I'd, I'd like to swap some people for some needs. But Well, Senator Hines and I are going to do the very best we can to make the very best case that we can. And I have to say that the commission has really dug into its work on six different subcommittees to begin to plug the holes in every area that we can um, and hopefully uh, be able to sneak in some support for school districts and our communities going forward. So, don't, these, don't these commissions now have a, just a pretty long history of just ending up being so i would say no i would say no phil really? because the foundation budget review commission is what resulted in the student opportunity act the student opportunity act is a playbook from the foundation budget review commission the rural schools commission has now taken its playbook from the foundation budget review commission for exactly that reason we saw that that commission study blue commission blue ribbon commission resulted in the student opportunity act what we're hoping to do is replicate the plan that was put forward by the Foundation Budget Review Commission with the Rural Schools Report in the hopes of making the case for some real transformational um, changes for that will support our rural communities. Yeah, you gotta have some, you gotta have some positive, Phil. Come on. I know, I know, sorry. <laughs> too, much, too much war and pestilence in the world, it gets you down. <laughs> What else was there? Are there any but, climate change issues? You know, any optimism there? Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think, as you know, Bob, you know, we just passed this wind bill. We were able to get the grid modernization legislation that I know that yeah. you've been so supportive of uh, for, and for you. so many years. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were really lucky, and it wasn't luck. It was it was constituents like you who've been pushing for this and. Uh, you know, there's a new chair of TUE. Uh, we were able to meet with him and get that um, grid modernization language in that will hopefully be taken up by the Senate. Uh, my understanding is that both the House and the Senate are preparing another climate bill. And so I think we do have another opportunity to really look at the other um, policy priorities like single parcel solar, which is another bill that I've introduced that would make it easier for um, condo condominium complexes and um, co-ops and homeowners, like you know, allowing them to take advantage of solar, which they can't right now. 
Um, so I think that we do have an opportunity moving forward to be able to further the work of the roadmap. Yeah. Is it is it ever going to be timely enough, given how far we were behind to start with? You know, I don't know, but I, we have to try. And I think we tried to do a municipal solar project here, and 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 what the uh, what, what EverSource wanted for the cost to upgrade their their yeah. substation made it impossible. And same thing happened up in Wendell with yes, with yeah, and the interconnection to. piece. The interconnection piece is something that I know is is has been talked about. Uh, I've certainly talked with the chair, the previous chair of TUE and the current chair. Something has to change there. Um, and I think with a combination of the grid modernization um, legislation that's moving forward now, and hopefully what we can Im include in this next climate bill, uh, we can begin to address those interconnection fees as well, because it's ludicrous that you can get to the end of a project and be told that you have to shell out one to however many millions of dollars uh, to upgrade. There's a million, Wendell's was three million. Yeah. yeah. And it kills the project. And yeah. that's, that's exactly what we need to be doing, what we should be doing to meet our clean energy goals. So um, I, I know that's part of the work of this, this wind bill that we just passed and certainly of the grid modernization council that's included there that really requires utility companies to plan for exactly that. How are we gonna to transition to having more solar and wind on the grid and ensuring that we don't have these interconnection uh, fiascos that end up killing green energy? I do wanna thank you for what looks like a big increase in the number of charging stations across the state. To what extent that's you guys versus, I don't know, uh, market forces or, or Baker, you know, I, I don't know. But now you, the you know, state, there are now charging yeah. stations in a, in a lot of the rest areas. Um, you know, there are charging stations now at, par, at, a, at the park and ride, right, right in, yes. you know, in, the, in Deerfield. Yeah, um, and I just talked with MassDOT this past week about, uh, federal dollars that will be coming in. And we are expecting federal dollars to be coming in via formula to further expand EV charging stations. Uh, that will also place a burden on our grid. <laughs> so you know, as we're yeah. transitioning to electric vehicles, uh, you know, I want to be talking with the Secretary of Transportation about he how he is interacting with the Secretary of EEA, Energy and Environmental Affairs, to make sure that um, you know, if we're if we're really serious about addressing our transportation emissions that account for forty percent of the emissions in Massachusetts, that we have to be looking um, at our grid and making sure that it can handle the transition that we're hoping for. But the state's calling for a big increase in electronic electric vehicles, and and we need to get over the hurdle of people believing there aren't enough charging stations. Range anxiety. Yeah. Well, that's, that's <laughs> you and that's I know it well, Bob. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, are you still the only uh, only legislator with an electric car? No, there are so many more now. Oh, good. It's, it's incredible. We only have four charging stations in the garage that I'm in, and. Uh, they're usually charging. The last couple of times I've gotten lucky when I've driven in and I've been able to- My complaint about Alewife. I drive into Alewife and park no. in Alewife and they're all taken, they're, you know, no. whenever you get there. Except the Saturday, occasionally you find one. But. <laughs> well, but I mean, we gotta get people, stop of... people from driving into Boston. Right, and, and we need to make sure that people who are living in apartment complexes who might have cars have a place to charge or who don't have a garage have a place to charge. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those are the real challenges that, that we have to overcome when it comes to um, to moving over to electric vehicles. And of course, the cost. Uh, you know, we need to be providing incentives for people to make that change. It can't be seen as elitist. And I know that as the cost goes down, it's becoming more acceptable to all portions of our culture. But mm -hmm. there's still big chunks of, of it that some of the most passionate environmental advocates are still pretty hard on electric vehicles for the, for the well, also people want to they don't want to just buy a car to buy a car I, I know 
uh, Rhett Moschino, I think has a, she's waiting for her car to die so that she's not putting a car into our, yeah. um, into our waste stream, uh, which she's certainly conscious of. So, and don't forget e-bikes. Uh, I have legislation out there for e-bikes and incentives around uh, electric bicycles, which may be able to get some cars off the road for some time um so that you can make those commutes whether in you know suburban urban or rural areas as we're also exploring outdoor recreation and getting people outdoors the other another thing is um the there's a couple of bills that were filed about logging in our state in the state forests mm -hmm. and um and as you as you may or may not know the uh, the state has filed their net whatever that, that an intent to log in the conway state forest a pretty pretty substantial logging operation um, and there's a group of conway residents that have vowed to lay down in front of bulldozers and get his rest arrested as many times as necessary but um, perhaps a more peaceful alternative to opposing that would be uh just a, an act of legislation requiring the, the local host communities consent uh before the state can do uh, you know, especially towns like ours that are what's 50 50 percent state farms, you know, the, the uh, we should have some say about our land, the land use patterns within our own town. And just because it's state property, somehow we have no say on it. Or can but, we get that logging held off until the legislation has a chance to pass? Yeah, it's it's a great point and one that I've heard often from constituents and uh, we will be meeting with with the group of constituents that you're talking about uh, that request came in first thing this morning. Uh, but we did uh, meet recent, recently, I guess it was a month and a half ago now, with the new DCR commissioner, Stephanie Cooper, uh, who I do want to say is really, really good. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to work with her on the MVP program and sewer and wastewater being included in that program. She was also um, instrumental on T the now no longer existing TCI program. Um, but she is really responsive and smart. And so I do feel like we are turning a corner right now with DCR. Uh, we did meet with her about the logging bills that are pending before the legislature. We do have an opportunity right now and going forward because there is um, a 10 year review of the landscape designation um, landscape designations that DCR uses. Um, and so they will be undertaking a public process on those landscape designations uh, that, that DCR uses in the management of, the, of their land. And one of the things that we talked to her about was our strong belief that carbon sequestration has to be centered and factored into state goals and metrics and practices um, as we consider how state agencies like DCR can help the Commonwealth meet its climate goals. But this has to be a conversation uh, because we do have people on both sides of the issue who feel very strongly about our environment. And I've been encouraging, you know, we just, we need folks to talk to each other uh, because I do believe that everyone is um, trying to get to the same, I, I, I like to believe everybody's trying to get to the same place. Uh, and that they they do want to do what's best for our forests and our animals and our ecosystems. Um, but this will be the beginning of a of a very public process. She has committed to that and having public hearings to ensure that we can hear from everyone um, in this interagency um, Re review of the the landscape designation process going forward so that we should be hearing more about that soon but that will be an opportunity certainly to make our voices heard um no matter where the, you stand on one the of issue. the things in that one of the things in that debate is you know that the forester the state foresters will say how logging is an essential part of carbon sequest blah, 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 and there's ecological reasons for it the thing that they don't talk about though is that for a logging operation in a state forest like Conway's um, that's not close to any major roads, um, it requires a whole infrastructure to be built. It requires road building. 
It requires culvert building under the roads. It requires landings for the trucks, to, for, the, all, for all the equipment to be built. Those are the things that, that are just like purely desecrating your forests. And, and you know, we, we have a, a, a local experience in 2004, Conway voted, town meeting voted to log its town forest. And that was because they had gotten a quote from a logging thing of $150,000 and everybody thought, lower my taxes, 150 sounds great. But, um, but by the time the town had to build the roads, the culverts and the landings, the amount that the town actually netted at the end of that was $40,000. And for that, we still have these hideous scars in all of our forests. And um, the one thing that has been re made really clear to us is that if anybody ever authorizes logging in our forest again, uh, tar and feather, uh, you know, <laughs> would be like a, you'd be wishing that you were tar, only tarred and feather. Um, we recently wrote our forest management plan, our, our, our next 20 year plan for the two town forests tiny amount of Conway and and the people of Conway were unanimous in wanting us not to authorize locking you know not to not to do any cutting any more than absolutely necessary you know, sick trees or insects mm -hmm. or whatever but but not not traditional logging and and their view is they own this land. The select board doesn't own this land. You know, the, the, the people of Conway own this land. And in the same way, the people of Massachusetts own our public land, not the DCR. Mm -hmm. And the DCR acts like they own this land and can decide what to do with it. And it would be helpful if you wouldn't mind sending me the the Conway plans, I, I or th I think that that would be a really uh, helpful document document yeah, sure. to take a look at if, if, if I could ask for that follow up from you all. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. One more thing that I wanted. So we um, remember way back, bringing you back to Hurricane Irene, um, which was what, 2010, See, right? 2000, 2011. So Conway had a major uh, rock slide and uh, loss of half a half a street up above an upper upper Baptist Hill Road up above mm -hmm. the Wesco, yep. and it was a fee because it was during a hurricane. It was covered in a fee uh, FEMA your federal FEMA uh, thing. That was 2011. We just have gotten the payment or got it's we. It takes so long yeah. <laughs> that, you know, the, the engineering was all done by 2014. The amounts that we were receive, or we were going to receive were set by 2015. Now those amounts by much less road work than it did just six years ago. Um, but we're stuck with that apparently. And you're talking Delaware. Yeah. Delaware, yeah. yeah. And, and all of a sudden what looked like it was going to be covered by FEMA is now only half covered by FEMA. Mm -hmm. and, um, and and it's sort of like they're the cause of uh, their delay, dilatoriness is the cause of our misfortune. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but they don't seem to be too impressed by that argument. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what, what can be done to hurry up their process, but a, a 10 year process to get um, roads fixed from a storm that's covered just on its face is insane. So I, I don't know how that can possibly be justified. And it, it doesn't seem to matter who the president is or who the party is. It just seems to be one of those deeply entrenched kinds of things that that's their process and how it can be engineered and all certified in 2015 and still take another six years to fund. And then you're stuck with that number. Well, and you know, and 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 I hear you. I, I know. I think it was Buckland that that recent, maybe in the last couple of years, finally received funding from that storm. Um, so I, I would fully support action at the federal level to to speed up that process. I also think, I also think the the condition, you know, that you have to bring it back to the condition that it was when the storm damage occurred, is is problematic. You know, if we're actually talking about addressing the problem. And then you may need to make improvements 
particularly as we're seeing these, these storms increase in frequency and intensity. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to keep <laughs> seeing the same problems in the same locations time after time and again, and you having to go through the same process. Um, you know, we just had, we were, we were pretty frustrated in this last July storm um, that we were unable to qualify for federal aid. Uh, thankfully, the state stepped up and provided that $7.5 million that you know, Senator Hines was instrumental uh, in leading on the Senate side. I offered the amendment on the House side. Um, but that you know, we're hopefully going to get that money out from the state in lieu of the federal dollars that are not coming in uh, because we didn't meet the thresholds at the federal level. So um, I hear what you're saying, and uh, I would certainly be supportive of, of changes and, to and export the, that at the federal level. One of one of our lessons of the tornado, you know, when when everybody from our congressman to our governor came and stood and said, your town will be made whole. You won't have to suffer financially from this storm. And uh, none of those promises were actually, that ended up coming true. And because all of the programs, they and they made us eligible for every program that exists, mm -hmm. but yeah. none of those programs provided reimbursement for your town roads that were damaged, your town owned guardrails on those roads that were damaged, or, the uh, trees that fall down on private property, and which is what most of well, and, and there, there's the damage from that because those trees are all still st there's, those trees are going to be there forever, um, which mar mars our landscape. But the, uh, no, until they catch fire, until they catch fire, <laughs> and they're huge fire hazards right now. And and but that's a whole other thing that there there's these uh, actual damages that you actually suffer that are not eligible for reimbursement under any program or any insurance policy anywhere. So that kind of sucks. I agree with you. And that's one of the reasons why we didn't meet the federal threshold was because so much damage was done to local roadways and why we ended up putting state dollars into, um, into this appropriation so that our small towns could be made whole because we don't have a lot of federal roadways. Except complaints, except complaints. We got complaints. <laughs> and good ideas. <laughs> and a lot of heart. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Anything else? Festival of the Hills this year? Yes, definitely. Okay. Parade. All right. Beautiful. I'll look forward to seeing you uh, hopefully before then. Good. Good. All right. Thank you all. I really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, I think you might be seeing us for April 8th for the flag raiser raising for oh, the yeah. children. Um, children. For the children. For the children. the children. Yes. Yes. Beautiful. Well, we'll see yes. you then. Hopefully good. we'll have good weather. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. Nice oh, you're so you. welcome. It's good Hi, to Nally, see bye, you Corinne. all. All right. Thank take you. care. Good to see you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. We give her, we give her an earful. Sure, I, I wanted to ask her about how her signature collection is going, but I don't know if collection <laughs> politics is appropriate. Yeah. She's, she's collecting signatures for her reelection, although no one's running against her, but she still, still has, has to. to yes, she does collect signatures. Yeah. Well, yeah, in the in past elections, she's been able to have like dinners and whatever. But now that she's not doing that, right? So. Uh, do we have any items not anticipated 48 hours? No. Town administrator update. My back, my back. <laughs> That's the update. <laughs> select board member. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just uh, um, select board member comments, concerns. Anybody? No. No. Mail. We just got a notification that the census department wants our town to participate in a special data collection thing. Yeah. Uh, survey of governments and survey of public employment and payroll. And um, is this something you would complete? Is this a review of how the census went? No. I mean, who would actually do this and provide this data? Uh, would that be you? That would be me? Veronica. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? So do you want, yes, yes. Do you want to do it? <laughs> oh, it does say we can opt out. Yeah, but see, we 
they need towns like us to bring all the averages down. You know, pay, look at the payroll survey. There's all these towns with real pay. We need to bring, they need to bring. Oh, they're they just need, sending this collectively to like. <laughs> yeah, so we, they need, we need to help them bring the averages down to our level. Um, oh. Next meeting next week, Monday, Monday, March 28th, where it will be a joint committee with the finance committee and the highlights are going to be capital requests. Capital requests. Yeah. We're going to bring the broadband committee in too. I'm oh, sorry, Franklin. Oh, Franklin Tech. Okay. Yeah. Good. I'll, I'll get ready for them. That might take longer than you think. And oh, then right. um, April 8th is the day that the warrants are due to select the articles. Yeah. And th that's one of the, you know, I when we talked about the school budgets last week, the one thing that it did not talk about was the capital request of the grammar school. And we, we talked about adding to the cap to the stabilization fund, but we didn't talk about what the actual requests are. And um and the 65 has been taken out already. Already I need it, yeah. It's, and the um and basically there uh, we'll talk about this next week, but this it's already public and everything. They have there's three capital requests. It's one's for sixty sixty thousand dollars for air conditioning Forget how many classrooms? One's forty thousand dollars, or it's, it might be the other way around. There's ones for four surfaces, ones for air conditioning, and then the twenty thousand dollars is for the dishwasher. The commercial dishwasher is apparently ancient and breaking, and they can't fix it. And the parts they that they haven't made it in ten years. Blah 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 blah. And of course, the dishwasher is something that's used by Conway residents that work at this school in the cafeteria that they see all the time. So. We are constantly reminded that even though it might be number three on the administration's capital list, you know, it's like it was, that was put third, that to some of our residents, that is definitely number one. Um, but that's, we'll talk about that. Other than that, anything else? No. Ready to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Aye. 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 Aye.